Hi, it's Luna and welcome to day 12 of Martha Eaton Reels 31 Days of Horror 2024. Today we are going to be discussing the fantasy horror, the drama, the toxic girlhood of 1986's Veneno para las hadas, or in English, Poison for the Fairies. Let's talk about it. Immediately, we can talk about framing, because is it that a lonely young girl falls under the spell of a domineering classmate, or a lonely young orphan clings to the friendship of a new rich girl, her only sanctuary from bullying and the isolation of her home life? I feel like the way that the film wants to frame it really is Flavia, the rich girl, who is lonely and shy, um, falls under the spell of Veronica, her classmate, who has aspirations to become a witch. The opening scene is very, <laughs> it's very cheesy, it's very 80s. So um, one thing to say is that the story is set in the 60s and it is in Mexico, the young girl Veronica who uh, is the witch of the scenario, is then shown to us in a scene that trivia was apparently cut from a fair few showings. It's black and white. <clears throat> she comes in with a candle and she cuts the throat of her nana. And it's then that the blood is all red. It's very cute. But also, I only say it's cute because the effects are what they are. And I said they reminded me of kind of a, a media project from like, you know, your final school years in high school. But I feel as well that as much as the film ultimately kind of like, well, in general rather, I should say, not ultimately, in general seems to side with Flavia. Um, Veronica is the first POV that we get. She is uh, being told fairy tales from her nana because she is an orphan. Both of her parents are dead. She lives with her nanny and her grandma. And her nanny tells her fairy tales, but her mother left her. And the first one that she hears, before we kind of get the opening credits, is about a witch. And she says something along the lines of like, what can a witch do? And her nanny says, like, a witch can do whatever she wants. And that's it. Veronica is then on that. Like, why is that not then a goal? A, to be a witch, to do whatever she wants. And we, we have these dorky effects again as part of the opening credits where it's kind of almost a still of her aging into a Halloween shop style witch. And... <laughs> I, I want to say that the Halloween effects carry on throughout this film in a way that really gives and really takes away. Like, they're definitely more of a feature than a bug, but there's a lot of moments that it kind of brings it down to a level where I'm, I'm invested in the drama of the friendship, the toxicity between these two little girls, and then Ah, Halloween witch cackle. <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> okay. Because definitely something that I wanted going into this film was a kind of relived experience of Jacqueline Wilson books. Um, for those of you not in the know, she frequently explored a kind of darker side of being a young girl in a friendship with codependency and kind of like a power struggle. But within that realm that is special and unique where as a child, you obviously are in that weird phase between kind of being responsible and not responsible for your actions and the kind of cruelty that that entails. Um, you know, frequently child cruelty is still then something that pops up in horror as a sticky issue. Even then, obviously, in law, it's a sticky issue. It's something that is then horrific because, obviously, there is then this kind of um, image of children as immaculate, kind of a, a kind of innocence that can't be touched. But 
obviously that's then the debate of like what age do you know that a child knows what they're doing and especially I think for little girls it's then very interesting being you know brought up and socialized as a girl there is then just an extra layer of codification to behavior and interactions where just a lot of toxicity pops up I feel like a lot of girls know someone growing up who didn't have a friend more than they had a pet or a project. It's a lot. It's sticky. It's interesting. It is then fun for the drama in a movie. But so, the plot. So, as I say, I think the film wants us to follow Flavia. And she moves into this new school. It's a Mexican kind of like Catholic school. So we've got that, that background Catholic school aesthetic as well, which we don't really then go into like Catholic schooling, but I do feel like if it's not too cheeky to say that a um, all girls Catholic school is then just a setting that is also something that incites a curiosity, like, whoa, ooh, we're going in deep. But she moves in and then befriends young Veronica, the girl who wants to be a witch. And it is then immediately an awkward friendship because of the fact that Veronica is bullied and then the manipulation that immediately takes place where she then invites Flavia around to her house and she says like, oh, I'm a witch. And she's like, oh, prove it. She's like, oh, I can't show you now. I'll show you later. And she shows her that she's a witch by tricking her into going upstairs and following her. But she goes and hides in a cupboard and the room that she's made her follow her to is the room of her abuelita, who is then like decrepit looking. And so it scares the heck out of Flavia to then see this old woman that she thinks is the witch that, that Veronica has become. Um, gives her nightmares. So we see that manipulation early. And she starts to kind of like convince her to do spells with her, um, introduces a snake into the class for further manipulation or a, rather a, a further incident in which she then ends up locked in a cupboard that both me and my partner went, the chokey, because it, it's got no lights and it's just a dark little cupboard. And I'm like, oh, whoa, I, you know, in some ways I expected worse from 60s Mexico in other ways. No, that's still quite harrowing. But then when she comes out and says like, oh, I don't want to be your friend anymore. Veronica says, well, if I'd got the blame for that, I would have been expelled. I think this is then a line that introduces another dynamic between the girls, which is that Veronica is a little povo, God bless. Um, a little povo and an orphan. And she is in the position where she says she would have been expelled. But Flavia, um, she has rich parents and like has just got to school and has that privilege that she wouldn't have been expelled. It's not then something that they talk about anymore because they're both little girls. Like Veronica had that awareness that like that's what would have happened is that she would have been expelled. But yeah, another like interesting dynamic of the entire film and the relationship is the way that Flavia just blithely moves through the world with that kind of veneer that only like rich kids can have experiencing the whole world with like no consequences for these things and so the thing about veronica as well is as i say i'm almost like even at the start on her side or not against her because she may be like unpleasant and manipulative but she's not an out and out evil person i don't think we ever got a confirmation of the ages of the characters but they feel like somewhere between maybe nine and 12 is my guess. But yeah, that age where, you know, they're all kind of like still living in a fancy land, like they could still be playing with dolls. One of the things that then Veronica tries to manipulate Flavia for is the idea that she wants one of her dolls and that she could just take it from her because apparently um, one of them, the aspects of Flavia's isolation is that then because her parents are rich, it does not mean that she doesn't see them a lot. But then she always gets apology dolls, you know, that kind of uh, dynamic. But it all really kicks off when one of Flavia's rich kid things is that she takes piano lessons and she hates piano. And so when she's talking to Veronica about this and the fact that Veronica's like a little witch, she's like, 
well, I can do something about that for you if you want me to. And of course she's like, yes, yes, of course. Um, I, I don't want to see my piano teacher ever again. And so they go down in this scene that I think is really like well done for the set pieces and the atmosphere. Um, that, that line again, the blur between kind of a kid's fantasy and the reality. She's got some little candles that have been like artificially painted black rather than actually being black candles. She's done it with, I don't know, some paints or something. Um, and that's what I mean, that, that blurring of like, it's serious business, they're gonna get rid of her piano teacher, but also like their kids. And I, I really enjoy that aspect. But then after they perform this spell, the, her piano teacher is dead. And this is the first adult face that we see is when she's dead. Uh, another thing that I like about the movie artistically is the way that all of the adults' faces are hidden. It reminds me of, um, oh gosh, I can't remember her name, but the assistant mayor in Powerpuff Girls how you never see her face. All of the adults in this film are like that. You just, for whatever reason, they're hidden behind a door, they're just too high up. You never get to see an adult face, except for when it's your dead piano teacher. Or mummies is another thing that pops up early on as a visual. Um, but yes, she dies and she goes to her funeral and um, collapses at that point and says to Veronica, I didn't want her dead, but of course she says like, wow, you said you wanted her to go away and to never see her again. And at this point as well, when it all kicks off, it's unclear in the film if then there is a supernatural element to it. Another thing that I kind of didn't like about it, I did at first, uh, there's always this kind of like a uh, very classical orchestra music that feels very, um, uh, well, I guess the easiest example to go to is old Disney, you know, think like Lady and the Tramp, think Dumbo, think Cinderella, that kind of like old background orchestra, where it kind of goes with the happenings, but also for me, for this film, was a little bit too upbeat a lot of the time. They're up to like some real mischief, you know, the things that Veronica demands of Flavia, especially after she's got this hanging over her head of, well, you asked me to kill your piano teacher, essentially. They get darker and darker, but the music doesn't reflect that, and that is a disappointment to me. This thing with the piano teacher also isolates Flavia because she then can't tell her parents because Veronica explained the witchcraft that they performed together means that if she tells their secret, the devil will come for her. And so her next step is to then commence the second half of the movie, which I do then feel is weaker. I'll tell you that now. Um, so Veronica asks like about what she's doing in the summer. Fabia says like, oh, we've, we've got a whole farm that we own, you know, again, she's got that kind of like blithe on awareness about how rich she is and because they're kids, you don't blame her for it. It is just like, they're very like, the pair of them are both in that awkward phase of like, neither of them are guilty because they're both children. But then she's asking like, oh, well then like, can, can I come to the farm with you? And she's like, no, nobody can ever, nobody ever comes with us. My dad doesn't allow that. We don't get any blowout from this one. She's like, okay, but you know, I'll have to tell them about the piano teacher and all of the other things. And so she does then end up going on holiday to this big old farm with them. And it's it's a really beautiful place. It's like got a got another opportunity for like some nice set design. I liked in the first half of the film though that there was like a lot of kind of. Um, this feels wrong to say it because obviously this is very specifically like an English period, but like a lot of it was like very Edwardian to me from my kind of general knowledge. Vases and doilies and pianos and that kind of set design. And then when they get to the farmhouse, that is then mostly focused on the outdoors. There's a cemetery nearby and a big old barn 
and then this kind of garage with some hundred year old cars in there and in that garage I feel like this is then the start of where the film misses out on the drama of their toxicity I suppose because at this point Flavio is just going along completely with everything that Veronica suggests and in this garage kind of area with the old carts she spots this pot on the wall she says no it's a cauldron as they take that away to the barn stash it with the hay bales and then go on just like this general quest for various little bits and bobs from creatures to make a spell to make poison for the fairies they're collecting lizards tails and spiders and toads and it's in these moments that apparently Flavia lets Veronica down because she wants everything to be secret. It's again more of that fairy tale energy because there are adults around but we don't really get to see them. And all the while she's saying keep it secret but she doesn't. And that kicks off as well when they go and get some toads by rowing to a nearby island. And there's just, there's a lot to be said, like for, for praise about these scenes where they're doing things like Rome to the Island. You would think, or I thought watching this film, that it would be another scene that felt like poorly edited, goofy 80s effects because of some of the previous 80s effects. But because of that, it, it had me looking specifically at the scene when they're, they're rowing to the island, waiting for that kind of effect of, oh, there's obviously a green screen behind them and they're rowing not in time. But they did seem to be rowing more in time than I would have expected. And yeah, like these close scenes were just, they're alone together because like they have to be. It wasn't then textual, but it well part of that t subtext of like that power dynamic between the two of them that there was a push and pull there. As much as Flavia is very innocent with the power that she does have, potentially over Veronica, like, it felt equaled out in those moments in the farmland. Um, but yes, when they get there, we do then have Flavia using that power over Veronica. There's a point where the boat is about to flow away and they're about to be trapped on this island together, but Veronica goes straight for that boat and then she pulls it back and is like, I did it, we're safe. And then Flavia starts laughing at her. Why? Because obviously running for this boat right by the shore, her white stockings are then completely muddy and that's what she's laughing at. And it feels deeper specifically because we know that, well, she's then poor and she's then rich. When they're being cleaned up later and, you know, scolded, um, Flavia then tells the nearest adult what they were doing and what they were looking for and so Veronica is not happy with that. And then one of the major breaking points is that they go get some grave dirt from the cemetery at midnight and that seems to be Flavia's breaking point. The point where she says, no, I won't. But something convinces her in the end that maybe they shouldn't so they go and we get like a little bit of a jump scare because we're in the kids world you know and as i said you don't see adult faces unless they're dead and so when then flavia gets a little touch on the shoulder and oh they've been caught it's it's actually kind of like oh oh no oh no i'm sorry i'm sorry parent that means they get led back and then like she gets scolded by her dad but then this is again another thing about the, the world that Flavia inhabits, like she's not really punished, she just gets up, we'll talk about it in the morning, they don't talk about it in the morning, and then the next day her dad is going off a business and is just like very normal to her, it's just like, oh, I've got to go away for a little while princess, like you don't really care, she's not really punished, but as a result of this, because again she was just blunt, says like we were getting grave dirt, Veronica's like, you shouldn't have told him that, this is supposed to be our secret. I don't trust you anymore, you can't do the spell with me. Don't talk to me anymore, not for the rest of the trip. Um, and there's a visual shot that I quite like, where then Veronica is on a swing in this kind of like natural tunnel formed by trees. Um, it's nice, I like it. I think that that was like quite an awesome location to do that because of the circle and the tree and the swinging. It felt like a pendulum, but also another thing about the swing that's there, when she steps off of it to walk away from Flavia, it's noose shaped. So just, just for those kind of horror visuals, I'm like, whoa.
then the bargain is made after that. So, I didn't tell you about Flavio's little dog. He's called Heepy, and he's like a little cocker spaniel looking thing. He's got black fur and he's adorable. I'm just, I'm just a dog lover. I don't, I don't know what you want from me. As Flavio is like desperately trying to cling to, to, to Veronica's approval, friendship, involvement, um, Veronica says like, oh, well, you know, give me Hippie. G g give him to me. Um, your dad will just get you another one anyway. And at this point, because of the things you've seen them do, you're like, what are you gonna do to Hippie? No, don't, don't give Veronica Hippie. He's a little boy. But they're not friends. Veronica does nothing bad to Hippie. But it's a little bit of a haunting line in a way by the end to her saying, your dad will just get you another one anyway. Because in a way, you feel like Flavia took this on board. So the finale is something that felt somehow inevitable, but somehow shocking. And in a way, the twist wasn't a twist, because the twist was rich people are bastards. So they go to the barn where the cauldron's been kept, and then we have... <laughs> There's another one of the bloody 80s Halloween shop effects as uh, Veronica is stirring the cauldron and we get a shadow of them like your standard, like I said, stereotypical witch with then just like a little cackle happening as well, like for God's sake. But as she's doing this, Flavia takes away the ladder to the upper part of the barn and then gets a little candle and then starts burning the hail bales. She picks up Hebe and leaves. And then, yeah, uh, Veronica's screaming, please, Flavia, please help me. Um, she breaks the glass and scratches up her hand, so she's bleeding and choking on the smoke. That's it. Cut to credits, and it's just like that bloody meme of the girl smirking against the house on fire. That's what happens. She leaves her to burn. And as I say, it feels almost like so close to that scene, like she did think, well, my dad will get me another one in terms of a friend. The entire credit scene after, we don't get a fade to black. It is just her static, smirking face against them, the active burning down of the barn until it is nothing but ashes. I love stories of like toxic girlhood friendships and the power struggle. I think the things that disappointed me were maybe the ways in which the toxicity like didn't go that far in some ways. A lot of it felt like it was quite eased into in a way that didn't feel like it was really creating any kind of like heart gripping tension between either of the girls. Because one of the things that is often engaging about this dynamic to me as then someone who grew up on Jacqueline Wilson, is then just, yeah, how high emotions can run when child cruelty is then something that just pops up so casually, because no one can be as casually cruel as children sometimes, I swear. Approaching it as an adult, it's so difficult because they're children, like, they don't then deserve full blame. But also, it's alarming the cruelty that then they've been taught, or have they been taught, part of then the other horror aspect is how much of that is human nature that we can just be so flipping horrible to each other. And with that girlhood code, the way that then that social netting is already being established, the way that things can get so snaky and underhanded and shady and manipulative. And yeah, as I say, funnily enough, I love to watch that dynamic as something that still draws me to a lot of period dramas. People are being horrible to each other, but again, en enmeshed in so much social coding that there's a lot of room for doubt and paranoia and just uncertainty that that's really what's happening. But you know it's what's happening, but do you know it's what's happening? I will say that I think that this film could have gone further down that road. In the second half, when I said it was disappointing me, it was along those lines of just, it really slowed down with their ingredients gathering. And I think that, at a guess, 
if there had been a third girl, if there had been another aspect of the dynamic there that would have been served well by another child character, especially because of their dedication to keeping the adults out of it, which I really liked, but it meant that they really then needed to have more bite to them. Because I think we did spot that again, Flavia is then the new girl. She's like a very desirable new friend. And so there's a few of the girls at school who clearly like want to invite her to her group, where obviously Veronica is undesirable. People bully her and don't like her and know that her vibes are off. But yeah, the way that then that dynamic is at school it's it's kind of left hanging and so we don't have the idea of like any other friend coming along and i i feel like a third wheel to this toxic friendship to this fairy poison would have been like more interesting to me i think we're going two and a half poisoned fairies out of five a good two and a half poisoned fairies out of five. I think that this is then inevitably as then like a Mexican 80s Spanish language film, probably really underrated. Thank you for joining me for my too late call to child line. Um, I hope you'll join me next time where we are cordially invited to day 13 of 31 Days of Horror in little old England. I'll see you then.